Hartford's ancient burying ground is the oldest historic site in the capital city and the final resting place of its founders, colonial leaders, and families. An excellent first stop on a magical history tour of historic Hartford. Entering from Gold Street or viewed from a neighboring high-rise, the ancient burying ground is a place of mystery and allure. Although located on the grounds adjoining Hartford's first church, it was a civic, not a religious burying ground. At the Main Street entrance is a statue of the Reverend Samuel Stone, a native of Hartford, England, and the source of this Hartford's name. An original proprietor, Stone settled in 1636 and was Reverend Hooker's assistant and then sole pastor of the first church until 1663. Daniel Wadsworth, founder of Hartford's Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art, also founded the Ancient Burying Ground Association in 1836. Sixty years later, Emily Holcomb and the DAR spearheaded a campaign to restore it. Wadsworth was the ultimate Hartford Brahmin. His paternal grandfather, the Reverend Daniel Wadsworth, was an old light pastor of Hartford's First Church. His maternal grandfather, Governor Joseph Talcott, was one of the longest serving governors in Connecticut history. His father, Jeremiah Wadsworth, was a commissary in the American Revolution, friend of George Washington, and member of the First U.S. Congress. Here is the Founders Monument. It lists all the founding heads of household that settled Hartford in the 1630s. It's a 1986 granite replica of the Brownstone Monument commissioned after the original from 1837 began to deteriorate. Although a city-owned property, care and restoration is now carried out by the Ancient Bearing Ground Association and before them by the Ruth Willis chapter of the DAR and other women's patriotic associations. In 1915, the Connecticut Society of the Colonial Dames commissioned these ornate plaques to commemorate Hartford's founding pastor, Reverend Thomas Hooker, and Connecticut's first governor, John Haynes. Almost 500 tablets, table stones, and monuments tell the story of Hartford's colonial past. These handcrafted tablets in brownstone, marble, and slate evoke a sense of place, past, and community. Wander at your leisure. It is a veritable feast for the eye and a reminder of those who toiled in the wilderness to make a world we have inherited. The earliest tablets are in the Puritan plain style, plain brownstone tablets with simple borders and simple inscriptions. Timothy Stanley on the left died in 1648, the earliest dated marker in the burying ground. Here are two more early stones. On the left marks the grave of Jonathan Gilbert, a tavern keeper and customs collector for the Port of Hartford. He was marshal of the colony and in 1663 carried out the death sentence of several women convicted of witchcraft. On the right, Elizabeth Bacon's stone of 1678 refers to her settlement in Hadley, Massachusetts, one of Hartford's daughter towns. Phineas Wilson settled Hartford from Ireland and was the county sheriff in 1687 during the famous charter dispute. Sarah Coles was from upriver in Hatfield, Massachusetts. Her father-in-law, Ozias Goodwin, was an original town proprietor. The first stones decorated with scowling winged skulls like this one from 1711 were imported from Boston. During the 1720s, a stonecutter from neighboring Glastonbury introduced the first native brownstone tablets with fanciful death heads and wild flowing hair. Because Hartford was the center of government and commerce, the ancient burying ground has an unusually diverse collection of stones produced by stonecutters from many parts of Connecticut and New England. This stone, dated 1732, was made by John Hartshorn of Franklin, Connecticut, the first native stonecutter to work the native schist, a hard granite-like material that resists weathering and erosion. Rachel Messenger's stone with its pudgy-faced angel and heart was made by Asa Hill near Farmington in 1737. This spider-faced stone for Thomas Copley of Suffield was made by an unknown stone cutter from the Simsbury area. Typical of the period, Copley was buried where he died, not where he lived. The earliest Connecticut Valley gravestones with winged angels were produced at the Middletown quarries of Thomas Johnson beginning in the 1720s. With their flowers and vines, pinwheels, dark eye sockets, and scowling teeth, these stones are a reminder of impending death. 
Artisans from the Eastern Uplands produced Connecticut's most artistic folk carvings. Here are examples from the 1770s by Ephraim Tucker of Bolton. Eastern Connecticut's most famous stonecutter was Gershom Bartlett, whose light bulb shaped heads and fish hook shaped eyes and noses are hard to forget. He later moved to Vermont, introducing this style to the North Country. Here are folk angels from the Manning family of stonecutters from Scotland and Norwich, Connecticut. Wild hair, bulbous lips and eyebrows, vivid wings, and elaborate borders mark their style. The Johnsons of Middletown flourished in the second generation, producing half of the gravestones sold in the Connecticut Valley during the 1770s and 1780s. Angels with wings pointed down and fanciful vine and flower covered borders are the hallmark of the Johnson workshop and of Ezra Stebbins who worked in East Longmeadow, Massachusetts. The 1770s was the golden age of folk carving in the Connecticut Valley with more than 20 small shop artisans vying for attention with their fanciful designs. On the left is work from Ebenezer Drake of Windsor and on the right is the work of Zerubbabel Collins of Columbia, Connecticut. Heads up for folk art, the ancient burying ground is a veritable museum without walls. Bring your camera because rubbings aren't allowed. It damages the stones. Early American folk art. It doesn't get much better than this pouty angel. Then came the American Revolution and the New Republic with its fascination with Roman classical ornament and memorial customs. Here is a classical urn and willow from about 1800. The New Age also preferred new materials, the purity of white marble imported from the Litchfield Hills and Vermont. This Egyptian-inspired obelisk from 1801 marks the grave of Lucy Whitman and was one of the last stones erected here before Hartford opened a new burying ground, Old North Cemetery, in the North End. Then there's all this amazing history. This table stone marks the grave of the Reverend Thomas Hooker, founder and pastor of Hartford's first church and author of the Fundamental Orders, the source of Connecticut's claim as the world's oldest continuous constitutional elected government. He died in 1647. His assistant, the Reverend Samuel Stone, took over until 1663. His stone, probably made by stonecutter Matthew Griswold of Windsor, is inscribed with a rare work of 17th century Connecticut poetry. New England's glory and a radiant crown was he who now in softest bed of down. Above all things he Christ his Lord preferred, Hartford, thy richest jewels here interred. George Willis, founder of a political dynasty, was born in England in 1590. He became a governor of Connecticut and occupied an estate on which stood the famous Charter Oak. There, in 1687, Connecticut's charter was protected to avoid a royal crackdown on independence. Table stones like this were the most costly way to mark a grave. On the left is David Gardner, who was born in Saybrook in 1636, the first white child born in Connecticut, and the eldest son of Lion Gardner, whose Gardner's Island estate in Long Island Sound is the only American estate still intact from an original royal grant from the English crown. On the right are two first church reverends, Timothy Woodbridge and Isaac Foster. Captain George Dennison was a veteran of the English Civil Wars, a notorious Indian fighter and the first resident of what became Stonington, Connecticut, a town he was representing in the General Assembly at the time of his death in 1694. Lieutenant John Allen, known as the Dictator of Hartford, held more public offices than any one of his generation, was fluent in Native American languages, served on the Governor's Council during King Philip's War, and represented Connecticut in negotiations with the five near nations of the Iroquois. He died rich with a large farm, sawmill, and two slaves, among the first African Americans to be brought into Connecticut. Joseph Talcott was a prolific political leader whose 20 years as governor and deputy governor was rare. Another governor buried here was William Leet, the last governor of the New Haven colony before it was absorbed by Connecticut and the next governor in line after the famous John Winthrop. Like most of the 
Puritan elites, he was college-educated in England before settling in America. While governor of New Haven, William Leach sheltered the famous regicides, Whaley and Goff. In the upper right is a map showing the original New Haven colony, which at the time included towns around New Haven, parts of what is now Greenwich, and the North Fork of Long Island Sound. One of the most fascinating families buried here are the Ledyards. John Ledyard, whose table stone is on the left, was born in England and came to America at age 19 and settled in Groton, Connecticut as a schoolmaster, where he raised his grandson, John Ledyard, the famous explorer. As a political center, Hartford was also involved in New England-wide military affairs. Interesting military connections are suggested by these stones. Timothy Bigelow was involved in the defense and development of the northern Connecticut Valley frontier in Charlestown, New Hampshire, while Colonel Nathan Payson was a hero of the Cape Breton expedition, the Siege of Louisburg, and the Crown Point expedition during the French and Indian War. Ebenezer Watson was the patriot printer of the Hartford Current who shaped its editorial voice during the turbulent years between the Stamp Act crisis of 1765 and the outbreak of the American Revolution in 1775. Hartford's answer to Paul Revere was a mechanical genius named Enos Doolittle, a silversmith and clockmaker who developed the first bell foundry in Connecticut. From the earliest years, Hartford was a cosmopolitan place that attracted immigrants from many places. Here are two who migrated from Bristol, England. Both died the same year at the same age. Thomas Barnard and Susan Tilly probably knew each other in the old country and in the new. Here are two from Warwick, Rhode Island and Goshen, Connecticut. It is unusual how many stones note places of origin. It wasn't all Anglos. In addition to Africans and Scotch-Irish, early 18th century Hartford attracted a sizable community of French Huguenots. John Bouchamp and Captain John Chenevard were successful international trade merchants. An Irishman, Lieutenant William Knox, operated a tavern near the town ferry. This beautifully preserved headstone and footstone were made by John Eli in East Long Meadow. One of the most opulent gravestones here, the work of Aaron Haskins of Bolton, Connecticut, marks the grave of Captain Israel Seymour, who ran a successful pottery shop and was killed by a stroke of lightning, a startling news story in 1784. A bigger news story involved the blowing up of the school, an accident where a group of young men preparing fireworks for the Stamp Act repeal celebration were killed when the explosives ignited and blew up the school building that, get this, doubled as an armament storage facility. Levi Jones and Richard Burnham died in the incident. These stones talk about unusual ways people died, in this case, drowning in the Connecticut River. Here we learn about early American occupations and professions. Roderick Lawrence, a graduate of the Yale class of 1779, was the son of John Lawrence, Esquire, the treasurer of the colony. John Porter, Esquire, was the controller of public accounts, or what we would call a fiscal watchdog. Captain Pownall Deming was an officer in the American Revolution and a member of the prestigious Society of Cincinnati. His descendants thought enough of him to erect a monument a century after his death. Several interesting monuments were erected here after the burying ground was formally closed, most honoring founders and ancestors. This monument, erected in 1912, remembers the first company of the governor's foot guard, whose armory is shown at the left. It was founded in 1771 by a network of Hartford elites as a militia company, 64 in number to guard the governor and the General Assembly. The last and only 20th century burial was for Emily and John Marshall Holcomb. She restored the ancient burying ground in one of the first and most important preservation efforts Hartford has ever seen. In the 1990s, a monument was erected to commemorate the 400 African-American slaves buried here, none of whom have personal monuments. The 1890s restoration of the ancient burying ground was a pioneering effort in restoration technology and historic preservation, spearheaded by Emily Holcomb, shown here. The site was in poor shape at the time, and many of the stones were disintegrating. Look at what restoration technology can do. Here are before and after shots of the Hannah Pratt stone. 
Patching compounds were difficult to match, but did preserve the look and the message. In the 1980s, the Ancient Bearing Ground Association undertook a new restoration campaign that continues to this day. This stone marks the grave of Richard Edwards, Hartford's first attorney. His grandson, the Reverend Jonathan Edwards, launched the Great Awakening. It was lying face down in the dirt before this work was undertaken. A new base was supplied and it was coated with consolidants to preserve it. Other stones had lost most of their inscriptions. Patching compounds and recarved lettering made a difference. This is what Ebenezer Watson's stone looked like. Too badly damaged to repair, it was reproduced. Here are two other 1980s reproductions so realistic you can hardly tell. The originals were illegible and beyond repair. Today, the Ancient Bearing Ground Association cares for the site, provides tours, advocacy, and sponsored this video. It is an important mission. If you would like to support the work or learn more, contact us at theancientburyingground.org. Thank you and enjoy visiting Hartford, a great place at the heart of New England.